everybody. Welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. And in this video, we're going to go over this phrase right here. Does not mean. And uh, it was kind of weird how I came across this or started thinking about this. I was preparing a video. And in that video, it got me to thinking about, you know, turn the other cheek. And then I was thinking about how, yes, turn the other cheek, but that does not mean that you you know, continually submit yourself to abuse. There's times where, um, you know, you need to remove yourself from a situation. It's not like, you know, let people take advantage of you and abuse you. And so I wanted to find that quote because I thought I had heard that before. And so I just looked up does not mean. And when I did that in the scripture citation index, it came up with 135 results in general conference between now and 1942. And I wanted to like get a feel for like, how often does this come up? I wasn't able to <coughs> necessarily find that exact quote. Although there is one that maybe I kind of got confused and it was actually this one. But anyway, I decided to put this on my phrase tracker. And so we're going to go over the phrase tracker which this is a tally of the number of talks that include these words or phrases uh, for each year going back to 1942. So I'm going to show you what I found. And then uh, because of what I found, I want to go over some of these talks that use does not mean because something weird happened as I, uh, you know, put this on my, on my spreadsheet. Before we do that, uh, here is the update on the Flood the Earth Challenge. We've shared 6,302 copies of the Book of Mormon so far. So we're shooting for 10,000. And then the goal for the channel is for each person to, to share at least 10. So try and look for those opportunities to share the Book of Mormon. And you can easily do it using the Gospel Library app because there's a share button when you go to Scriptures to share the Book of Mormon app. It gives you a link, and then you can send that out to your friends or people that you know, however you would like. Text, email, direct message, whatever. So try to at least get to 10, and uh, amazing things will happen. Amazing things already have happened, as you can see here, with people getting baptized and people meeting with the missionaries. Okay, so let's just go, uh, you know, decade by decade. Here's the 1940s does not mean uh, comes up in nine different uh, different talks in the 50s comes up in nine in the 60s comes up a lot more comes up in 17 in the 70s it comes up in 16 I'm getting the number down here at the bottom right if you can see that in the 80s, it looks like it kind of drops off a bit, goes back all the way down to 9. So the 60s and 70s, uh, there was a higher frequency of the use of this term. All right, let's look at the 90s. Right, let's get 99 in there. 15, so it goes back up. The 2000s, 12 times. And now, look at right now. So let's look at the, oops, I included 2010. Let's look at the uh, 2010s. 30 times. 30 times for the 2010s. Now let's look at the 2020s. The 2020s were already at 19. So let me zoom out. And let's just focus on this column right here to the far left. We've already done videos about all these other ones. And uh, <clears throat> you can see, going back in time, there's a lot of white space and a lot of lighter colored cells that are this, this like light pink because, you know, one, two, these are low frequency uh, or a small number of times. So you have this kind of like general... Uh, increase in the 60s and 70s and then it kind of dies down and then it really picks up starting in 2013 so pr 
probably since about 2013 until now, they've been saying does not mean a lot more. I find that interesting. And uh, I'm going to be I'm going to be honest with you. I haven't looked at too many of these talks that we're going to look at. But I'm going to put forward a guess right now that the reason why they're saying that so much recently <clears throat> is because there's so much confusion. And there's so much um, distortion of doctrine and uh, there's so many lies in the world and uh, so much polarization and uh, agendas that are trying to skew everything, uh, including doctrines of the church. And people are getting confused. There's a lot of confusion, <clears throat> confusion, strong delusion, right? That's my guess. So for the rest of the video, what I would like to do is see just what in the world are they saying? Why are they saying does not mean so much within recent years? Especially look at 2022. Uh, that takes first place for <coughs> use of the phrase does not mean. 2017 looks like it's probably in second place and 2014 in third place. Let me just go back and verify. Yeah. In the 60s, the most that it said in any given year is four. So that's really saying something. Six, seven, and then eight. In 2022. Okay. And already two times this year. We'll have to wait for October to see how that plays out. So what are they saying? So we're going to start just at the top. This is in chronological order, and we'll just work our way back. Let me zoom in just a little bit more. That's probably good. Okay, this is D. Todd Christofferson. One in Christ <clears throat> is the name of the talk. We can also see in this example that unity does not mean simply agreeing with everyone agreeing that everyone should do his or her, his or her own thing or go his or her own way we cannot be one unless we all bend our efforts to the common cause yeah that makes sense because right now there's a lot of like this philosophy of like <clears throat> you know you need to like just do you D you know do whatever you believe is right it doesn't matter what right actually is as though it's like a objective thing, something that applies to all reality. Everyone's being taught right now, just do what is good for you. What is good for you may not be good to me or what might be good to me might be, not be good to you. So it's like this moral, you know, relativism. So, okay. All right, let's move on to the next one. This is elder Anderson. My mind caught hold upon this thought of Jesus Christ the name of the talk. He says, filling our mind with power of Jesus Christ does not mean that he is the only thought we have. This actually might be helpful for people that have uh, mental illness, especially psychosis, because uh, that can be how that's interpreted. But let's see what, what it really is. If, and by the way, if you have mental illness, please go be seen by a professional uh, to help you with that. So you don't get mental illness stuff all caught up in um, the gospel. Okay, so filling our mind with the power of Jesus Christ does not mean that he is the only thought we have. But it does mean that all our thoughts are circumscribed in his love his life and teachings, and his atoning sacrifice and glorious resurrection. So circumscribed, you know, that's like, uh, <clears throat> I think I know what that means. It's like drawing a circle or like setting limits. Scribed, uh, yeah, restricted within limits. Geometry, drawing a figure around another, touching it at points, but not cutting it. Okay, cool. So, so yeah, so it's basically like keeping all the way that you conduct yourself and your thoughts, keeping it within those limits that are set by the Lord. Jesus is never a forgotten corner because our thoughts are, our thoughts of him are always present 
and all that is in us adores him. So you don't have to, every second of the day, be thinking consciously about Jesus Christ and go to extremes like that. It's it's much more practical. It's just when you come across certain situations where the gospel has something to say, such as you should not lie, then, you know, if he's already in your heart, you've already made him a part of yourself, <clears throat> then um, you have him, you know, he's he's in your thoughts. Okay, the next one, I'll, do, I'll just do it like this. The name of it is Beauty for Ashes, The Healing Path of Forgiveness by Kristen M. Yee. And she is second counselor in the Relief Society General Presidency. Please know that forgiving someone does not mean that you put yourself in a position where you will continue to be hurt. Ah, oh, see, this is the one that I was talking about. <coughs> so this this is like, um, I think this goes along with turning the other cheek. You know, you turn the other cheek, but you don't have to like stick around and keep getting your cheek smacked over and over again by uh, by an abuser, by a toxic person, right? Please know that forgiving someone does not mean that you put yourself in a position where you will uh, continue to be hurt. Quote, we can work toward forgiving someone and still feel prompted by the Spirit to stay away from them. And that's from the church website. Forgiveness doesn't mean putting up with getting hurt. You know, I feel like someone might like to read that on their own time. I'm not going to read it here, but... I'll put the link for this in the description below. Okay. I think sometimes we get we fall into that trap because of our misunderstanding of of the doctrine of the, the doctrines of the church or when we read the scriptures. <clears throat> I, I've noticed there there's a lot I'm not saying that I'm perfect, but when we read the scriptures, we all read the scriptures according to our own understanding and also with our limitations of you know uh, reading comprehension or whatever. And that's why it's helpful to do everything together as a church. And, and I think that this is the big problem with Christianity, how it's kind of disintegrating and people are going from these different denominations to becoming non-denominational, non-denominational, but beyond that, going it alone. And they're like, well, I'm I'm the part of the church because I'm a Christian, but I don't have to like go meet with people. It's like an individual thing. And I think there's a lot of error in that kind of thinking because then you're left to your own interpretations. And there's so many times that I see people saying things that are in direct opposition uh, of what's been taught by the leaders of the church. <clears throat> They'll read a scripture and think, oh, it means this. But no, it does not mean that. Um, we have in, we have prophets and apostles that are inspired and interpret things with the spirit of prophecy, and it's their it's within their responsibilities to do that. So anyway, I could see someone being in a bad situation, and uh, you know whether it's like a family relationship of some sort or something else um, where it's not necessarily to it's not necessary to stick around. And sometimes it's appropriate to uh, either cut ties or at least distance yourself from abusers, people that will just continually bring you down. They're like, <clears throat> they're bent on competing with you. They're bent on diminishing you. They're bent on controlling you. You don't have to stick around for that. It's not good to fight fire with fire, you know, and hence turn the other cheek. But maybe after you get slapped, you know, just, you know, fade into the background and you don't need to stick around with, for that. Okay, the next one, Happy and Forever by Elder Garrett W. Gong. This is the October 2022 General Conference. Um, his family relationships clarified. My friend said, I feel free at peace. It makes all the difference to know 
who my family are. My friend muses, a bent branch does not mean a bad tree. How we come into this world is less important, important than who we are when we leave it. Okay. Next one. This is uh, President Nelson. And oh, he has two does not means. So this is in his main talk of the October 2022 General Conference called Overcome the World and Find Rest. He says, now, overcoming the world certainly does not mean becoming perfect in this life, nor does it mean that your problems will magically evaporate because they won't. And it does not mean that you still make that you won't make mistakes. But overcoming the world does mean that your resistance to sin will increase. Your heart will soften as your faith in Jesus Christ increases. Overcoming the world means um, growing to love God in his beloved son more than you love anyone or anything else. Uh, how then do we overcome the world? King Benjamin taught us how. He said that the natural man is an enemy to God and remains so forever unless he yields to the enticings of the spirit and putteth off the natural man and cometh, becometh a saint through the atonement of the of Christ the Lord. Each time you seek for and follow the promptings of the spirit, each time you do anything good, uh, things that the natural man would not do, you are overcoming the world. Okay, so it's not being perfect. And it doesn't mean that you won't make mistakes. But it's having that drive to become perfect eventually and to have your priorities straight and not give in to the natural man. The next one is is called uh, Is the Plan Working? by Elder Adrian Ochoa of the Seventy. This is why he sent a Redeemer. When we struggle for any reason, that does not mean the plan isn't working. That is when we need the plan the most. Yep. Again, it we're not going to be perfect. Things are going to go wrong. And uh, we are here to experience trials and obstacles. So, all right. Next one, Elder Renlund, your divine nature and eternal destiny. Even after, after, even after sincere repentance, however, we may stumble. Stumbling does not mean that the repentance was inadequate, but may simply reflect human weakness. How comforting to know that the Lord sees weaknesses differently than he sees rebellion. Uh, and you know what? This, one's, this one uh, stuck out to me. Because uh, I myself am prone sometimes to perfectionism. Like, I, I feel like I'm just so far short of what I need to be. And I am. And we, we all are. I felt it really, really bad on my mission because I, I felt such uh, pressure to see success. You know, you go to an area, don't have any baptisms, nothing is really going on. It's like, am I doing something wrong? Am I not living the uh, the commandments um, as well as I can and following the mission rules? But anyway, look what it says. So how comforting to know that the Lord sees weaknesses differently than he sees rebellion. We should not doubt the Savior's ability to help us with our weaknesses, because when the Lord speaks of weaknesses, it is always with mercy. Uh, then there's a footnote. This is Richard G. Scott, Personal Strength Through the Atonement of Jesus Christ, Ensign or Liahona, November 2013. Consciously planning a sin with the callous, so callous, like not feeling, insensitive, desensitized, no heart. Con consciously planning a sin with the callous plan to repent afterwards. In other words, pre-planned repentance is repugnant to the Lord. Those who do so crucify themselves, this, crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. This warning should be considered. For if we sin willfully, 
after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for a judgment in fiery indignation. All right, I think that's all we're going to read from this one. So <clears throat> I think that's especially true if there's like addiction and um, you should, you should uh, seek for help with addiction and do all that you can, but just be aware that I, I, I also wouldn't give yourself the excuse like, oh, uh, well, I have an addiction, so what am I going to do? Because at that point, I think you cross the line because then you're like, oh, well, I'm OK. It's like you give yourself um, a pass. But like if you're working, you're doing your best, you messed up, you mess up sometimes. It's different than just rebellion. All right, let's go to the next one. Elder Christofferson, our relationship with God. Um, so this is in a footnote. Let me read this part first, though. Um, if life doesn't fall out precisely this way, or according to an expected timetable, they may feel betrayed by God. But things are not so mechanical in the divine economy. We ought not think of God's plan as a cosmic vending machine, where we, one, <clears throat> select a desired blessing, two, insert the required sum of good works, and three, the order is promptly delivered. And then in the footnote, it says, King Benjamin taught that all God requires of us is to keep his commandments, for which if ye do, if ye do he doth immediately bless you. This does not mean, there it is, this does not mean, however, that all blessings come quickly. God's blessings are immediate in the sense that his commandments carry their own reward. It also means that obedience to his commandments brings the blessing of living in his presence by having the, his Holy Spirit with us. Okay, the next one is by Elder Rasband. And it's interesting how so far it seems like the majority um, of the people that are using does not mean are apostles or the prophet himself. You know, and, and it would, you know, it would more fall within their lane of responsibility to correct uh, things, you know, to like outright say, this is not right. Uh, this doctrine is not right. Okay, so let's go on to this one. So Elder Rasband, let's see, second, religious freedom fosters expressions of belief, hope, and peace. As a church, we join with other religions protecting people of all faiths and persuasions in their right to speak their convictions. This does not mean we accept their beliefs, nor they ours, but we have more in common than we have with those who desire to silence us. You know, this this is... Oh gosh. <laughs> I don't even know where to start with this. Um, I guess that, look, there's like two things going on here. Uh, one is the idea of building bridges. And there's people that are, that have a, a zealous spirit, not in a good way, but like they're zealots. They, they don't want to mix at all. Uh, in, not mix. That's probably a bad word, but they don't want to, um, find common ground with other groups that are that are different from our own so for example other religions and sadly when i was talking to um dan c peterson uh hopefully you saw that interview that me and troy did with dan c peterson he was a professor at byu and his thing his uh area of expertise is uh, the near east and islamic studies and in Arabic and stuff like that. And he wrote an article for the Ensign talking about Islam. And he said in the, in the interview that I did with him that uh, he got hate mail from people, you know, for talking kindly uh, about, about Islam and, and Muslims, which is so bizarre because it was published in the Ensign. It's not like he forced his way into the Ensign. It's not like the brethren 
didn't know that he wrote it. In fact, he said that the first presidency asked him to do that. You know, so on the one side, when dealing with other groups, there's people that are just completely um, against anyone that's other, you know. But then on the other side, there's people that uh, would, you know, they would go the opposite direction. Instead of like completely rejecting that group, they would go so far as to start to accept those beliefs. And um, that's where danger comes in. And if there's somebody from another religion, particularly uh, evangelicals, they love that. They love that because that means that there's some wiggle room and they might be able to work with you and then get you away from the church and then, you know, into their own fold. Because, um, you know, on the one side, the people that try and distance themselves from other religions and completely become cut off from them um, in, in zealots, essentially, um, you know, they're, they're basically openly hostile and everything. And uh, it's like a defensive type thing that's going on. It's like in response to uh, to a perceived threat. That's probably like the main driver. Whereas on the other side, it could be that people, uh, they just, they don't want to feel like they're on the outside. You know, we've talked about this before, how many other Christian groups say that we're not Christian. And so people who care about fitting in uh, that's hard for them. They don't want to feel like they've been left out. And so they may try and do things to feel like they're more um, accepted by those groups. So you can go one of you can go one of three ways. Either you can go all the way against that other group or you could actually go too far and accept too much of that group, uh, including uh, false doctrines and stuff like that. Or the third and best way is to be just be rooted in the gospel. Be kind, build on common ground where there's not doctrinal issues, but don't uh, become a recluse and cut yourself cut yourself off from the world. You know. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So that so that this is important. I think it's important that he said this. This does not mean we accept their beliefs, nor they ours, but we have more in common than we have with those who desire to silence us. Okay. The next one, President Nelson, <coughs> in uh, his talk called Spiritual Momentum, April 2022. Now, <clears throat> sorry. Now a caution. Returning to the covenant path does not mean that life will be easy. This path is rigorous, and at times we feel like it, it will feel like a steep climb. The ascent, however, is designed to test and teach us, refine our natures, and help us to become saints. It is the only path that leads to exaltation. So... Yeah, don't expect that, again, that by keeping the commandments or by coming back to church or whatever, that magically everything's going to be just suddenly okay. And actually, in, in a lot of ways, it probably will. You'll, you'll, you'll be receiving blessings that you otherwise wouldn't have had. So I think that I can guarantee you that your life will improve both on the inside, just like with your peace spiritually, but also uh, with with blessings that you'll receive, but there's still going to be obstacles and challenges and, and things like that. So uh, you can't be naive about it and think that just everything's going to be just, you know, without struggle. Okay, the next one, worthiness is not flawlessness. This is by Bradley R. Wilcox. I've quoted him a number of times. <clears throat> he gave us one of these quotes about the 10 Lost Tribes, which is on my 10 Lost Tribes spreadsheet and uh, he's also on my second coming quotes spreadsheet where he gave a, a very interesting prayer uh, I think it was during the 2022 
the 2022, no, the October 2022 general conference where he prayed for the second coming to happen, which I had never heard in a general conference prayer before. Okay, so he says, um, some mistakenly receive the message that repentance and change are unnecessary. Yeah. Why? Because that's what people are preaching, that there's nothing wrong with who you are. And uh, I do tend to believe that there's this, like, in the background, this Gnostic uh, philosophy, like this inverted version of Christianity and Judaism, because my understanding is that in the early days, uh, you had both Jewish and Christian Gnostics, but they basically teach a really distorted version of the creation story where uh, the creator of this world is the demiurge and he's like a sadistic and controlling person he made an imperfect creation and you came here and you're a part of the divine higher god that's higher than the demiurge and so what your goal is is to uh, discover that divinity within you in your true self uh, not the self that you were assigned um, by the demiurge and by society. And then you're supposed to ascend and like, you know, do that kind of thing. Uh, again, I would refer you. I really, I really would encourage you seriously. This isn't the first time that I've heard it, but this is probably the best explanation or the best presentation I've seen on Gnosticism and Hermeticism, right here, as below, so above, by James Lindsay. <clears throat> I would encourage you to watch this. I'll put it in the description below, where he talks about how it seems like this is kind of like a driving force behind, uh, or, or or underlying underlying philosophy of secret combinations and uh, these you know, these, these, these hidden groups of people that wield power and stuff like that. It's based on these kind of teachings and it's, it's really bad. So I'll, I'll put this in the description below. So anyway, some mistakenly receive the message because they're always putting it out there, probably mostly because of these secret combinations that are running based off of Gnostic and Hermetic <clears throat> philosophies that repentance and change are not necessary. God's message is that they are essential. But doesn't God love us despite our shortcomings? Of course, he loves us perfectly. I love my grandchildren, your imperfections and all. But that does not mean I don't want them to improve and become all they can become. That, that's the problem with like these different things is uh, there might be like a lot of like good, like someone is struggling with a particular thing and people are telling, you know, society is telling them, no, that's perfectly fine. That's who you are. And they can go on and live good lives, do good things, you know, but that one thing, whatever it is, is holding them back and it's limiting their potential. Because the most that you can be is to become exalted, just like our Heavenly Father. So, anyway, but the, that does not mean I don't want them to improve and become all they can become. God loves us as we are, but he also loves us too much to leave us this way. That's really good. That's really good. This is a rebuttal to the current uh, philosophies of the world. Elder Dale G. Renland, uh, the, peace of, the peace of Christ abolishes enmity. Um, Jesus Christ explained that his doctrine was not to stir up the hearts of men with anger, one against another, but that his doc doctrine is such, is that such things should be done away. If I am quick to take offense or respond to differences of opinion by becoming angry or judgmental, I fail the spiritual stress test. 
This failed test does not mean that I am hopeless. Rather, it points out that I need to change. And that is good to know. Yeah. Yeah, just view it as, okay, this is something that I need to work on. This is like a, a weak spot within my soul. I need to work on this and not just focus on the easy things. The next one is by Elder Anthony D. Perkins of the 70. Remember thy suffering saints, O our God. Okay, first, suffering does not mean God is displeased with your life. 2,000 years ago, Jesus' Jesus's disciples saw a blind man at the temple and asked, Master, who, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he, has, that he was born blind? His disciples seemed to incorrectly believe, as do far too many people today, that all hardship and suffering in life are the result of sin. But the Savior replied, Neither hath uh, this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be man made manifest in him. The work of God is to bring, bring to pass our immortality and eternal life. But how can trials and suffering, especially suffering imposed by another person's sinful use of agency, ultimately advance God's work? Okay, well, I'm not going to read the whole talk, but if you're if you're under the impression that your current set of circumstances is a, a punishment from God because you've sinned, I would say no. Um, it could be <clears throat> it could be that poor life choices have brought you to where you're at, and the Lord does allow that. But um, we have to like look at things in a balanced way and not just always think that, oh, something's gone bad. Uh, the Lord is upset at me. And that's something that I, I actually kind of struggled with myself a little bit uh, when I was going through a lot of hard stuff, you know, earlier this year. Thankfully, it's pretty much done now. But I was like starting to think, oh, my gosh, am I am I doing something wrong? What is going on here? But I did I did keep the right perspective and it's just like looking back at it now i feel like i i grew a lot through all those different uh trials and obstacles and, and some of them actually brought about good that wouldn't have happened otherwise like for, for example i did that video where um i had the the worst day in my life uh the the most fear that I've ever experienced when uh, we thought that Jenica might have ovarian cancer. And uh, to make a long story short, we had gone through this whole process and then, uh, you know, then we finally went and got a, a um, ultrasound and they didn't find anything. And in that process, you know, before the ultrasound, they wanted to do a bunch of tests. They did some like blood work and stuff, you know, drew blood for labs and uh, come to find out that, you know, she had some issues uh, like pre-diabetes, for example. And so uh, that's something that we wouldn't have found out. We wouldn't have found out without going through this horrible experience. Um, so thankfully, she didn't have cancer. But we found out that there were some things that we needed to work on. And we took it seriously. And because of that, we've changed our diet. And we're both losing weight like crazy. And we're becoming healthier. So... It, it was a really unpleasant way to, to start that process. It was very unpleasant. Believe me, I felt like the world was ending. But it brought us to a point where now we're getting healthy. And I'm, I'm at uh, 30 pounds that I've lost so far. <laughs> Simply by not drinking soda anymore uh, and just eating healthy, according to what a dietitian would tell you. I'm not doing any special, I'm not doing any special diet. I know, I know some of you do that, and that's great, but I'm doing it according to, uh, you know, like I said, what a dietitian would tell you, and it's working. We're exercising, we're eating right, and we're eating the right portions, and we're avoiding certain things, and eating more of other things like fiber, and it's working. So it was a huge blessing. 
so that's just an example of like something going bad, but it, it was actually to start something good. Okay, let's go on to President Down A Jokes, defending our divinely inspired constitution. Let's see, number two, our belief that the United States Constitution was divinely inspired does not mean that divine revelation dictated every word and phrase, such as the provisions uh, allocating the number of representatives from each state or the minimum age of each. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So it, it, it helps us understand that it's like, oh, it's not like a perfect document, but overall it was uh, divinely inspired. And there's some things that, I don't know, may need to change or, or whatever. I, I think it was a mistake to remove uh, prohibition. I am completely 100% against alcohol. And I don't have a way to know what would have happened if uh, prohibition had remained in place. Maybe things would have been worse, but maybe not. Maybe not. I tend to think that wickedness probably was the driving force behind uh, prohibition being repealed. And uh, like it, like an overall general um, wickedness uh, within our nation. And alcohol has destroyed so many lives both literally taking people's lives uh, as well as uh, just all the fallout uh, from people that are that abuse alcohol or that drink alcohol, especially those that are um, addicted and alcoholics. It's one of the words it's so bizarre to me that we we like look so passively on drinking and alcohol and stuff like it's just no big deal you know there's like wine testings that are viewed as like a you know a fun thing to go to and oh let's try this different type of wine like alcohol is bad it is really bad it is bad 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 i i think we're going to be shocked after this world when we see the full extent of the evil caused by alcohol consumption anyway all right let's move on Next one is from, uh, let's see, who is this? This is Elder Scott D. Whitting of the 70, Becoming Like Him. You are good enough, you are loved, but that does not mean that you are yet complete. Yeah. Again, it, they're hitting on this same topic. The idea that you are good enough, and then that implies that you are complete that you're perfect as you are. So he clarifies here, no, you are not yet complete. There is work to be done in this life and the next. Only with his divine help can we can we all progress toward becoming like him. Okay, President Oaks, love your enemies. Our article of faith written by the prophet Joseph Smith after the early saints had suffered severe persecution from Missouri officials declares we believe in being subject to kings presidents rulers and magistrates in obeying in obeying honoring and sustaining the law this does not mean that we agree with all that is done with the force of law it means that we obey the current law and use peaceful means to change it it also means that we peacefully accept the results of elections. We will not participate in the violence threatened by those disappointed with the outcome. In a democratic society, we always have the opportunity and the duty to persist peacefully until the next election. I would seriously avoid, you guys, anybody that... Uh, is of the mindset that you have to do unconventional things, especially when it comes to using force to um, change laws, change uh, election outcome results. Uh, 
I'm, I'm just going to let him speak for himself. Just listen to what President Oak said. Again, we have to be careful with the, you know, I know better or the ends justify the means, you know, you know, this election, this and this and this happened and this isn't right. And so we need to we need to force this or we have to whatever. We, we need to we just need to be civil and we need to make sure that we do our part to help make sure that the system works. And again, like I've said before, I don't know how much we do, how much all of us uh, actually participate in the process. It's like something that I think about more and more each day that I should probably become more involved. Okay, the next one is by W. Christopher Waddell. Uh, he is, okay, Bishop W. Christopher Waddell, first counselor in the presiding bishopric. The talk is called There Was Bread. Um, in today's environment, with a pandemic that has devastated whole economies as well as individual lives, it would be inconsistent with a compassion... Okay, it would be inconsistent with a compassionate savior to ignore the reality that many are struggling and ask them to begin building a reserve of food and money for the future. However, that does not mean that we should permanently ignore principles of preparation. Permanently. Only that these principles should be applied in wisdom and in order. Yeah, the, the, the church, the Lord, they work through practical means. They learn, they, it, there's never like a really, really, really extreme time. Or if there are, it's very few and far between. But it, the Lord prefers to work like this, in wisdom and in order. Marathons rather than sprints practical ways rather than supernatural ways. Anyway, so that in the future we might say, as did Joseph in Egypt, there was bread. The Lord does not expect us to do, to do more than we can do, but he does expect us to do what we can do when we when we can do it. As President Nelson reminded us in our last general conference, the Lord loves effort. Okay. The next one is by Elder uh, Dieter F. Uchtdorf. God will do something unimaginable. Uh, he says, "Now this does not this does not mean we don't experience turbulence in our flight through mortality. It doesn't mean there won't be unexpected." Uh, instrument failures, mechanical malfunctions, or serious weather challenges. In fact, things may get uh, might get worse before they get better. So just going along with that idea that just because you're living the gospel doesn't mean there's not going to be trials. And there will be. And uh, I think they all have different purposes. Sometimes to actually make your life better. Other times just simply to uh, give you an honest test. Of your resolve to live the gospel. Okay, Elder Anderson, uh, we talk of Christ. This same scripture adds that we preach of Christ. In our worship services, let us focus on the Savior Jesus Christ and the gift of his atoning sacrifice. This does not mean we cannot tell an experience from our own life or share thoughts from others. While our subject might be about families or service or temples or a recent mission, everything in our worship should point to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, is he talking about, like, uh, speak of Christ in our homes, speaking of Christ in the church. In our worship services, let us focus on the Savior Jesus Christ and the gift of his atonement. This doesn't mean that we can't tell experiences. Okay, so I guess whether you're teaching or bearing testimony, but uh, it should point toward Christ, whatever you're saying. Okay. The next one, Elder L. Todd Budge, 
consistent and resilient trust. Um, okay, this is in the footnote, <clears throat> footnote seven. Okay, so he says, the good news of the gospel is not the promise of a life free of sorrow and tribulation, but a life full of purpose and meaning, a life where our sorrows and afflictions can be swallowed up in the joy of Christ. Uh, see also Neil E. Maxwell, Brim with Joy, from a BYU devotional in 1996. Quote, when we reach a point of consecration, our afflictions will be swallowed up in the joy of Christ. It does not mean we won't have afflictions, but that we will put in a perspective. Okay, but uh, sorry, but they will be put in a perspective that permits us to deal with them. With our steady pursuit of joy and with each increasing measure of righteousness, we will experience one more drop of delight one drop after another, until, in the words of a prophet, our hearts are brim with joy. At last, the soul's cup finally runs over. So this is something that, that is being brought up a number of times now. And, you know, don't be embarrassed. You don't have to share if you don't want to, of course. But have you ever been in that frame of mind that you thought that things should be going better for you? Uh, because you were living the, the living the commandments the best that you could, and then you were surprised that things still went wrong. Is this like a common thing? Because I'm not so sure I've seen like a ton of it in the church. Um, I feel like one thing that I've seen is like um, where you have like a. A, a, um, a young woman that, you know, isn't getting married and they feel like by going on a mission, then the Lord will bless them with someone to marry afterwards. I feel like I've seen that a few times. I don't know. It, the, with as much as it's coming up, I wonder how many people are struggling with that or have that, that misconception. Okay, this is Elder Uchtdorf, Your Great Adventure. Um, may I remind you that God does not need you to sell, quote unquote, the restored gospel or the church of Jesus Christ. He simply expects you not to hide it, not to hide it under a bushel. And if people decide the church is not for them, that is their decision. It does not mean you have failed. See, and this is, this is one that I struggled with on my mission. Because uh, I was excited, motivated, and I was just like, why? I don't know. And I, I did have success, but like in my first area, uh, I didn't have any direct success. Um, there was somebody that ended up coming to church because of me, but they were in a different area. But I contacted them on the street, and then they ended up getting baptized, but not by me. So that was nice. But I was just like, why aren't we having any baptisms? And it's not because we failed. It's, it's just, that's just, it's just reality. It's just reality and it's fine. So it does not mean you have failed. You continue to treat them kindly, nor does it, okay. You continue to treat them kindly, nor does it exclude you or exclude that you invite them again. The difference between, between casual social contacts and compassionate, courageous discipleship is invitation. All right. We'll just do a few more. I'm not going to like read all 165 instances that this has shown up in general conference, but maybe we'll go back just to uh, when President Nelson became president of the church. Uh, Elder Paul B. Piper, all must take upon them the name given of the father. Oh, and he's of the 70. Okay. So, um, by emphasizing this truth in every dispensation, our loving Father assures all of his children that there is a way back to him. But having a sure way available does not mean that our return is automatically assured. God tells us that our, that our action is required. Wherefore, all men and women must take upon them the name which, which is given of the Father. 
All right, next one. Let's see, this is Elder Shane M. Bowen of the 70. The role of the Book of Mormon in conversation. It is in footnote 15. So first it says, the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then in the footnote, it says, President Ezra Taft Benson taught, quote, the Lord himself has stated that the Book of Mormon contains the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That does not mean it contains every teaching, every doctrine ever revealed. Rather, it means that in the Book of Mormon, we will find the fullness of those doctrines required for salvation, and they are taught plainly and simply so that even children can learn the ways of salvation and exaltation. Okay, and this will be the last one. This is from uh, Douglas D. Holmes, first counselor in the Young Men General Presidency. What every Aaronic priesthood holder needs to understand. Okay. As you study your Aaronic priesthood duties, you will see a clear charge to invite others to repent and improve. That does not mean we stand on a street corner shouting, repent ye. <laughs> More often it means that we repent, we forgive, and as we minister to others, we offer the hope and peace that repentance brings because we have experienced it ourselves. Uh, let's just do one one more. It seems like Elder Uchtdorf has used this uh, quite a few times, relatively speaking. Okay, this is from Yearning for Home. And uh, at this point, he's actually uh, President Uchtdorf because he's second counselor in the first presidency, second counselor to Thomas to President Thomas S. Monson. I testify that when we embark upon or continue the incredible journey that leads to God, our lives will be better. This does not mean that our lives will be free from sorrow. We all know of faithful followers of Christ who suffered tragedy and injustice. Jesus Christ himself suffered more than anyone. So, okay, so it's that same, it's that same idea. No, he, he does it one more time. Look, this is another talk by Elder Uchtdorf. Sorry, I got to see what this says. Okay, it's called Bearers of Heavenly Light. But just because spiritual trials are real does not mean that they are incurable. We can heal spiritually. Okay. I'm like tempted to keep going. Let's uh, do... Okay, th th look. No, there's another one from Elder... Okay, we're going to do two more. Th this will be it. I'm not going to go to the next tab, to number two, or the next page. We'll do Elder Anderson... Uh, and then, and his talk is called Overcoming the World, um, which makes me think of President Nelson's talk, Overcome the World and Find Rest. And then there's another one from Elder Uchtdorf. So, okay, Elder Anderson first. Overcoming the world does not mean uh, we, we live a cloistered life, protected from the unfairness and difficulties of, immort of mortality. Rather, it opens the more expansive view of faith, drawing us to the Savior and his promises. While perfection is not complete in this life, overcoming the world overcoming the world keeps our hope aflame that one day we shall stand before our Redeemer and see his face with pleasure and hear his voice, Come ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. All right. And in case you don't know what cloistered means, I've I've seen this before in like a it was like this like um not really a board game. Well, I guess it was kind of like a board game that was like medieval themed. Like you have cloisters, but let me just put it up here. Uh <clears throat> having having or enclosed by a cloister as in a monastery <laughs> keeping away from the outside world sheltered 
so yeah and that that was the context uh that it was like monasteries <laughs> um okay so overcoming the world does not mean that you suddenly make your home into a monastery and take vows of silence <laughs> and uh keep keep your kids from interacting from the kids of the world although in some cases it depending on how how bad of influence it's probably appropriate to um be careful with that but yeah you can't become reclusive you can't you know go off out into the boonies you know into the country and just never interact with anybody because how good are you doing as a like how how well are you gonna shine your light or let your light shine if no one can see it if it's like 500 miles that way um okay let's go to the last one okay this is elder uchtdorf no sorry at the time president uchtdorf uh perfect love casteth out fear we are therefore not ignorant of the challenges of the world nor are we unaware of the difficulty the difficulties of our times but this does not mean that we should burden ourselves or others with constant fear and this has been something i've been dealing with on this channel since the beginning and uh i feel like it's pretty pervasive in this particular community people watching for the signs of the times because um well some people for one thing will read the scriptures and invent their own perception of how things are going to happen and they they do it in a very fearful way rather than focusing on the fact that it's going to be a great day for the righteous but it's going to be a dreadful day for the wicked and that the lord will preserve his people i i know that even the righteous will you know barely escape but they're going to be preserved and it doesn't do anybody any good to um uh promote fear and to make other people afraid uh, especially if you're living righteously and if you trust the scriptures and you trust the lord and that this is his church and that there is protection in going to the temple and being in your home if you make your home a righteous place and being gathered to the stakes of zion these are places of refuge and safety both physical and spiritual but it's it's so sad to see members of the church that are just like so just like drowning in fear you know um i i would listen to the prophets they don't talk in that kind of way that um some other people do where they paint a very bleak picture of the second coming where there's going to be just so much suffering uh you know for the saints and that you're gonna have to do this and do that and da, da, da. listen to the prophets that's why i have this entry on my uh quotes a through z spreadsheet called oh it must be under future is bright yeah future is bright these are all recent quotes talking about how the days ahead are amazing they're good uh stop being afraid i would listen to the apostles and prophets before any other person that paints a bleak picture who doesn't know because they're not a prophet and they're just <clears throat> giving you their interpretation of the scriptures without reading the words of the prophets and how they interpret the scriptures and what they say about the future so for example this is one of my favorite ones because so many people uh like to just get really scared about the united states and the constitution and um all these like fantasies of a dark future for america that's like something that's like really pervasive and um i'm not ignorant that we're in a bad place right now but let's let's listen to dallin h oaks a prophet seer and revelator 
And uh, at this time, the first counselor in the first presidency. Let's see what he says about the Constitution. Our belief in divine inspiration gives Latter-day Saints a unique responsibility to uphold and defend the, the, defend the United States Constitution and principles of constitutionalism wherever we live. We should trust in the Lord and be positive about this nation's future. And uh, what I see time and time again is example after example of people being negative about the nation's future. And uh, I, I, I don't know what to say. That That's not what this prophet, apostle, uh, seer, revelator, that's not what he's saying. Look what President Nelson says. I know that he is just as optimistic about your future as he has ever been. And then later in the talk, again, this is President Nelson. The future is bright for God's covenant keeping people. So listen to the prophets, not um, people that push doom and gloom. Look at, okay, this is, this is going to be the last one, I promise. This will be the last one. President Nelson, A New Normal, October 2021 General Conference. This is the dispensation when no spiritual blessing will be withheld from the righteous. Despite the world's commotion, the Lord would have us look forward to the future with joyful anticipation. So are we joyfully anticipating the future <clears throat> or are we filled with dread and darkness and doom and gloom and fear? And are we spreading that to other people? All right. Well, that's going to be it for this one. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.